All right, everybody, uh, welcome again to what's going to be a very exciting talk series with our special guest, Dr. Bedlack. Before we kick that off, I'm going to hand it over to Mira, who I believe has a few announcements she wants to uh, give to you all. Great. Thank you. Do you mind sharing your screen? Sure. Give me one second to pull that up for you. Hi, everyone. How are you? It's so nice to see you. Uh, as you know, my name is Mira Gandhi. I'm the chief of staff of Everything ALS and your personal uh, person, your fighter. Um, and I'm here to share some updates with you. So we'll start at the very beginning of the slideshow. Uh, James, thank you so much. Okay. So we're just going to give you some basic updates about Everything ALS. Okay. On to the next slide. Um, so today I'm just going to go over the Radcliffe and the speech study uh, survey, which is a $50 incentive, which is really cool, especially around these holiday times. Um, nice to get that extra cash flow. Um, and then we've added some extra talk series. I'll save the good news for a little bit, um, but well, let's go ahead and go to the next screen. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the the speech study, um, which is the IRB approved study that we want to continue getting more people involved in, per, specifically people living with ALS. So why don't you go to the next screen? Um, I'll toss, also talk about the Radcliffe for a second. This is our multidisciplinary study that we are launching right now. Um, it's really exciting. We're um, partnering up with Zephyrx Oral Analytics and Feed Me along with Bristol Myers Squibs. Um, so you can go to the next page. Um, the batteries of these sessions is weekly and we'll be measuring your, your walking ability, your speech, your vital capacity, um, your lung function, just to get a gauge of how you're doing on a weekly basis in order to get some digital biomarkers out there. So let's go to the next page. Great. Sorry, I'm talking and admitting people into this uh, session. So um, if you were interested in, volu or in volunteering for the speech study or the Radcliffe study, we'd love to have you. Uh, so what we're, I'm going to have you do is go to everythingals.org. And from there, you just hit that research button and you click to join and you can find out more um, right there on the side. And do has sent the link on the side, just go ahead and put your, your information there. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and there's just some basic information that we gather from you and some more basic information regarding the Radcliffe study. Uh, you, I've created a um, great video for the ALS Radcliffe study, which is published on YouTube that we'll put on the website, which will give you uh, a quick overview of it, but let's keep going. Um, we've created an app specifically for this study, which is really beneficial to you because we'll be able to track the progression of your symptoms uh, as, as the weeks develop. And so we've created this app and it's also a great way to have a personal diary for you to write like, oh, my left arm has weakness, my left hand has weakness, and, and it will all be integrated into one place so you can bring this to your physician or your healthcare provider, uh, which is a really neat tool. Right here, I have the the flyer for a survey um, that is is released, and it's it, I think it takes about thirty minutes. Some people have done it here, so they can tell you uh, on the chat. But it's a really quick survey, and it does give you fifty dollars. And we would love for you to participate. I'll include the link in a second. So let's keep going. And then really quickly, I just wanted to tell you that. Typically, everything ALS does biweekly events, and these biweekly events are great, but what we wanted to do for the end of the year is we wanted to focus on you and to give you a community during this holiday season. So we've decided to do our uh, Wednesday ALS expert talk series on a weekly basis up until December 21st. So as you can see, we have a few exciting speakers coming to talk, including our friends with Prime C at Neurosense Therapeutics. We have Merit I can't say that last name. Uh, sh someone should, can help me. <laughs> and, thank you so much. And we have McFinn and Heidi and the Alawalia 
plan with holiday tips and tricks. And more excitingly, next slide. Oh, and if you have any interest in topics for the tips and tricks, uh, please email uh, Mr. Clan, um, and we will get those talked about the tips and tricks session. And on the next slide, I just wanted to tell you that Everything ALS wants to host a holiday party on December 21st. Uh, please wear your favorite holidays, sweaters, your hats, and um, come and be present. And McFinn, did you want to say anything? I'm sorry, I kind of steam drilled you there. Oh, I just wanted to say that folks, the holidays are a time when family gets together and we're a family. So we didn't, we, we couldn't think of anything better just to have us together. And if you want to be one of the speakers, you can, but there's, there's nothing there for you except for holiday cheer. And we love you. So please come join us. Great. And we have any questions at all? I will send some links on your on the chat, uh, but without further ado, I'd love to have James announce Dr. Budlack because obviously we all want to hear from him. A man who really needs no introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. <laughs> Returning to us is Dr. Bedlack. Dr. Richard Bedlack grew up in a small town in central Connecticut. He went to college at William and Mary in Virginia, then back to Connecticut for an MD and PhD in neuroscience at UConn. Finally, he came to Duke, where he completed his medicine internship, neurology residency, neuromuscular fellowship, and master's in clinical research science. He is currently a professor of neurology at Duke and director of the Duke ALS Clinic. He has won awards for teaching and patient care, including Best Neurology Teacher at Duke, Health Care Hero, Strength, Hope, and Caring Award, America's Best Doctor, and the American Academy of Neurology Patient Advocate of the Year, and the, well, I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Ross Moosen. ALS Patient Advocate of the Year. He has received ALS research grants, participated in ALS clinical trials, published more than 130 ALS articles. He is the leader of the International ALS Untangled Program, which utilizes social networking to investigate alternative and off-label treatment options for patients with ALS and leader of the ALS Reversals Program, which attempts to understand why some people with ALS recover from it and to make this happen more often. He lives in Durham, North Carolina with his wife, Shelly, and two mischievous cats. Without any further ado, I would love to welcome Dr. Bedlack. Oh, got to unmute you there, Dr. Bedlack. We got you there. <laughs> Here we go. Can you hear me now? Crystal clear. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. And I do, uh, as Indu said, love your shirt. That's fabulous. This is specifically for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can share my screen again here. All right. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me back. It's, it's actually, I think, been two years since I last talked to the group about this ALS reversals research. And so um, what I thought I would do tonight is just give you an update. First, I wanted to get some disclosures out of the way. I do have some active research support from the ALS Association and from some companies, Orion and Medicine Nova, as well as the Healy Center at Mass General. And I consult for a number of companies. Mostly what I do for these companies is help them uh, to try to design more patient-centric research trials, expanded access programs, and also act as a member of some of their data safety monitoring boards to try to make sure that the trials are safe for people participating all the way through. So the first part of this is gonna be a bit of a review because I figured after two years, we probably would have some new folks here who didn't see my last talk. So I'll start off just talking a little bit about my experience with ALS progression in the early part of my career. And then I'll tell you about my first encounter with an ALS reversal and what I decided to do about it. First, how I came to decide that these things were worth devoting a large percentage of the rest of my life to studying, how I decided to define them, what some of my theories are, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. I'll show you some of the things we've learned about ALS reversals in two programs that I created, one called STAR, Study of ALS Reversals, and one called ROAR, replication of ALS reversals. And I'm not good at multitasking, so 
I'm not going to monitor the chat until the end, if that's okay. Um, otherwise, I'll probably shut down my whole computer by accident here trying to click on that chat box. No need to worry. We'll get the questions for you. Okay. We'll do it at the end. So, yeah. So, I, I saw my first uh, person with ALS when I was still a resident at Duke back in the late 90s. And I'll never forget that case. It changed my life. I thought it was the most amazing story, the most incredible collection of physical exam findings I'd ever seen. And I just remember my attending coming in and saying, it's, you know, this is what we call it, but we really don't know why it happens. People who get this, they always experience rapidly progressive disability. Their lives are always dramatically shortened and there's really not much we can do about it. And it just didn't sit well with me. I drove home that day and that was when the seed was planted for me to spend the rest of my career trying to find options for people with this disease and trying to do research to give them some hope. And so I built you know, a very large ALS clinic and I learned how to measure progression, I learned how to measure the progression of disability. And there's different ways we do it. The main way we still do it is with a questionnaire called the ALS Functional Rating Scale. We're now using the revised version. We abbreviate that ALS FRSR. It's 12 questions. Each question is related to some specific motor function. For example, writing, feeding, or dressing. Each question is scored by a person living with ALS between zero, which means there's no function there at all. They need someone else to do it all the way up to four, which means that's perfectly normal. And so the best you can do on this scale is four times 12, 48. The worst you can do is a zero, which I don't think I've ever seen to this day. The scale does decline fairly linearly if you look at large groups of patients at an average rate of about one point per month. And then we also can measure progression by survival. And believe it or not, there's different ways to measure survival. The most common way to measure survival is tracheostomy-free survival. And the reason that most people do it that way is that once you get a tracheostomy and you're attached to a breathing machine, you don't die from ALS, you die from something else. And so if you're trying to measure survival related to ALS, this is probably the best way to do it. And again, there's an average, if you look at a large group of people with ALS, the average tracheostomy-free survival time is three years from symptom onset. So within the first few years of my career, I saw something really obvious, and that is that there's tremendous differences between patients on these measures of progression. So over on the left-hand side of this slide, you see a group of about 40 people living with ALS. Those are their ALS FRSR scores over 84 months. And you can see that some are very flat, they're hardly changing at all, and others are incredibly steep. They're changing much faster than one point per month. And you can also see tremendous variability in tracheostomy-free survival. So I told you what the average was, but 20% of people with ALS can live more than five years without a trach. 10% can live more than 10 years, 5% can live more than 20 years. And you know, there's examples of people who've lived more than 50 years with ALS, like for example, Stephen Hawking. It took me a few more years to recognize that progression can be variable in a person at different times over the course of the disease. And so in order to understand this and to quantify it, I got together with some really smart people that know statistics and we looked together at a database called PROACT. So in this database is longitudinal information from people living with ALS who participated in clinical trials. And certainly just about every clinical trial uses the ALS FRSR score. And so we focused only on people who had been assigned to placebo groups in clinical trials because we wanted to see what the natural history of progression looked like in individuals. And so in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, you see one person's ALS FRSR score over 600 days of follow-up on a placebo. And what you can see is this is not linear progression at all. You know, there's some progression between day zero and day 350. By about day 400, all the way out to day 550, there's no progression at all. It's totally flat. That's what I would call a plateau. And then toward the end there, you actually see some recovery of lost points. I would call that a small reversal. And you know you can quantify this. You can quantify this by looking at the percentage of people in that database who have different degrees of ALS FRSR stability or improvement lasting different amounts of time. 
And that's what this complicated figure down here at the bottom is. So this Duke blue line is the percentage of people in that database who have a stable ALS FRSR score lasting different amounts of time. So there's a lot of people who have a stable score that lasts six weeks, about 75% of the people in the database are stable over that short period of time. And if you stretch it out, it's a much smaller group that's stable over a year. But amazingly, you can still see 10% of people in that database can be stable on that scale for an entire year. And then the green line is a one-point improvement. The orange line is a two-point improvement. Aqua line is a three-point improvement. Purple line is a four-point improvement, lasting different amounts of time. So again, it's, it's less and less common to see big improvements, especially lasting long periods of time, but they do happen. And so what I concluded from this is, is that the progression of ALS in individuals is variable at different times. And just for fun, I read this book. I read a lot of books about Lou Gehrig. I think he's a fascinating person. This was one of the most detailed uh, books about Lou Gehrig that I ever read it really sort of chronicled almost every day of his last full year of Major League Baseball, written by Dan Joseph. And uh, he actually reached out to me and said, There's something really strange about Lou Gehrig's numbers. I was reading your work about, you know, temporary or transient ALS reversals, and I think he might have had one. And I think Dan was right. So we put together this table. <clears throat> And we looked at Lou Gehrig's batting average and slugging percentage for his whole career. So just to remind non-baseball fans, batting average is the number of hits divided by the total number of at-bats. So if you got a hit one out of three times, your batting average would be 333. Slugging percentage is the total number of bases per, per at-bats. And so the higher the number, the more powerful a hitter you are the more you're likely to get doubles, triples, home runs compared to somebody like Ichiro, who was a great player, but mostly got singles. His batting average was really high. His slugging percentage was low. Well, Lou Gehrig's career batting average and slugging percentage are still amongst the greatest of all times. Batting average, 340. Slugging percentage, 632. So during most of the last year of his career, his numbers were much lower. You can see here from April to mid-August, his batting average was 274, slugging percentage all the way down to 486. And then all of a sudden, for most of the month of August, he just exploded. All of a sudden, his average was better, but even more impressively, his slugging percentage was way better. And we looked carefully at a lot of things. We looked at the number of games that were played that month. No real difference from any other month. We looked at the quality of the pitching he was facing that month. If anything, he was facing better pitching that month than any other month of his last year. And so no simple thing seemed to explain it. Something seemed to happen to him physically. And if you read the book, he was actually noticing like a dramatic improvement in his strength for no apparent reason. And then sadly, that just all went away toward the end of the year. His average dropped and his slugging percentage did too. But that's what I call a temporary ALS reversal. And again, I I think those are fairly common. What's not common and what took me totally by surprise was around the year 2010, when I came across this case online, the case of Ms. Nell DeBoos. So she experienced a really classic story for ALS when she was 43 years old, gradual painless onset, weakness started in one limb, progressed across her body. Within six months, she was totally unable to walk had to have somebody do everything for her, feed her, dress her, bathe her. And within a year, she was now you know, totally paralyzed and short of breath and hospice was being discussed. And you know, she was seen at UVA by several different neurologists who I know who are fantastic. And um, she had all the right exam findings documented. She had the right EMG findings documented. She had a lot of testing for ALS mimics, imaging, blood work. I agree with the diagnosis that she was given at UVA of ALS. And I agree with the fact that she progressed over the first year to, to where she was nearly dead. And then over the next two years, she recovered. She just unexpectedly recovered all of her lost strength. And uh, that, was, that was all 30 years ago. And she's essentially normal since then. I mean, she still lives in Virginia, runs a farm, 
climbs ladders, milks cows, builds snowmen. Um, so, I mean, it was a jaw dropper for me. And I started to ask around to some of my more senior colleagues and said, I'm kind of aware of these small fluctuations, but have you ever seen anything like this? Well, it turned out these had been seen before. And in fact, they had been reported in the literature dating all the way back to the 1960s. Even, even at the time that I was seeing Ms. Boost, there were already at least a dozen cases of, of dramatic ALS reversal described in the medical literature by different neurologists, including some of the biggest names in the history of neurology. But what no one was doing was trying to study these patients. Most of them were just reporting on them and saying, just letting you know, I saw this, I don't know what it was. I sure thought it was ALS, but they got better and I discharged them from clinic. And I thought, you know, there's actually a precedent for studying people who are unexpectedly resistant to diseases and having what you learn turn into a treatment that works for everyone with that disease. And so one example occurs within HIV. There's a group, group of people called elite controllers. These are people who get infected with the HIV virus. You can measure it in their blood, but they never seem to get sick. They never seem to develop AIDS and they don't take medicine. It's somewhere around 1% of everybody with HIV who acts like this. And again, for a long time, people just shrugged their shoulders, but then somebody decided, let's study these people. Let's put them all in the same database. Let's look at genetics. And it turned out that many of these people had the same abnormal gene. It was an abnormality in a gene called CCR5. They called their abnormality Delta 32. And it was the first time that people actually looked at what that gene did and asked, how is this related to HIV biology? And lo and behold, it turned out that it coded for a cell surface protein that HIV needed to get into cells. And in these elite controllers, the confirmation of that protein was slightly altered. And as a result, HIV could not get into cells and make these people sick. And the drug company Pfizer you know, jumped on that new knowledge and created a drug that blocked that receptor, a CCR5 blocker called Meraviroc, and it works for everybody with HIV. So to me, the, these precedents tell me that we absolutely need to study these ALS reversals. Well, if you're gonna study something, the first thing you have to do is figure out how to define it. And so after, again, talking to a lot of colleagues and thinking a lot about this, I think there needs to be three parts for them to be included in, in my research. First, there's gotta be a clear ALS diagnosis. And that means I've got to actually have medical records that allow me to independently confirm the right history, the right exam findings, the right EMG findings, and the right testing to rule out ALS mimics. Second, there's gotta be progression to the point where the person was disabled from weakness. And third, there's gotta be a dramatic and persistent recovery of lost motor function and at least some disability. So sometimes people will say, well, how many ALS FRSR points do you have to have to be an ALS reversal? Well, it isn't that simple. I mean, I would really need to look at the details, but in general, I would say an improvement of four points lasting at least six months would be the absolute minimum. But, but in fact, most of the ALS reversals that I've included in my program are much more than that. And in fact, we don't even need a number of points to confirm that they're ALS reversals. So for example, some of these patients could not breathe without a ventilator and now they breathe normally. Some of these patients could not swallow and needed a feeding tube for nutrition and now they swallow normally. Some of them lost the ability to speak intelligibly and now they talk normally. Some of them were wheelchair bound, now they walk, some run. Some of them were completely dependent in their activities of, of daily living and now they can do those things on their own. So that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for to be included in my program, big, big improvements. The other thing you have to have is you have to have some theories if you're gonna study something, some hypotheses. And I've got three. The first is maybe these people never had ALS in the first place. Maybe they had something that no one's ever described before that meets our criteria for ALS, but it's actually something else. Second is maybe there's something different about these people in the first place, kind of like the elite controllers so that no matter what they decided to do, they were gonna recover from ALS. And the third is maybe they found some treatment or combination of treatments that worked for them. 
So let's start with the first hypothesis. It's a very difficult one to refute because if there's something else out there that's been around for over a hundred years that looks exactly like ALS, but it recovers spontaneously and it's not ALS, I'm not exactly sure how to test for that. What I can say is that all these people had, you know, histories, exams, EMGs, all classic for what we call ALS. And they all had testing for all the mimics that we know of that have arisen over the past hundred years of study. Second piece of evidence I would offer you is that four of these 58 ALS reversals have a family history of ALS. It's almost 10%. That's about the same percentage as we see in large databases of people with you know, more typically progressive ALS. It sure would be weird if these people had something completely different from ALS that looked just like it but got better, and they also had a family history of classical ALS. It's just too much of a coincidence in my opinion. And then the third is the way that they recovered. You know, they didn't recover by magic. They recovered exactly the way that people with other motor neuron diseases, like for example, polio, recover from. So polio, you know, was at one time the world's most common motor neuron disease. It affects the lower motor neurons, just like ALS does. ALS also affects upper motor neurons, but you got rapidly progressive muscle atrophy and weakness when you got polio. And some people died from it, but if you survived, you actually could get stronger. In fact, many people who had polio, who at one time were paralyzed, have completely recovered and now appear to be functioning normally. How did they get better? They got better because the motor neurons that didn't die from the polio infection, they actually sent off branches and reconnected with muscle. And this is a diagram of what that looks like. It's called collateral sprouting. So up here, in the upper left-hand corner of the figure, you've got this hypothetical muscle innervated by four motor neurons. Now, uh, in the second panel, in the upper right-hand corner, one of the motor neurons dies from polio. And so now the muscle is denervated, it's weak, it starts to atrophy. But over time, if the body clears whatever it is that's killing the motor neurons, the ones that are left alive can send off extra branches. And now the muscle is fully connected again and it's strong. How do I know that people with polio recover like this? How do I know that ALS reversals recover like this? Because if you do an EMG on someone who recovered from polio or the few ALS reversals that had a repeat EMG after they recovered, the EMG is not normal. You can see that the muscle is not innervated by the same number of motor neurons. It's innervated by a much smaller number of motor neurons that are doing each doing a much bigger job than they were born to do. That's called re-innervation changes. So the patients with ALS reversals have re-innervation changes on EMGs. So if they're not mimics, then the next thing I wanna know is there's something different about these people that might've helped them beat this disease like the elite controllers. And in order to do that, I've created this program called STAR, Study of ALS Reversals. And there's four parts to it. The first is to find more of these people. So that's part of the reason I keep talking about this so that if somebody out there one day sees this YouTube video and knows somebody who might've recovered from ALS, maybe they'll connect me with that person. And um, as of today, I know of 58 confirmed ALS reversals. Next, I wanna put these people for the first time in history all into the same database and compare their demographics, their disease characteristics, their comorbidities, and all the things they took to people with more typically progressive ALS who are in other databases. Next, I wanna get as many different kinds of samples on them as I can. Blood samples, saliva and stool samples, tissue samples. And there's a lot of different things I wanna do with those as I'll tell you in a minute. And then finally, I wanna ask these folks a lot of questions. And that's gonna help me understand what they might've been exposed to that might have contributed. And so here's the latest demographics hot off the press this morning from my medical student, Natalie Skidgen. So um, you can see um, that like, like ALS itself, the demographics of, of ALS reversals, there's more men than women. In fact, it's tilted even more toward men in the reversals. So in, in databases of typically progressive ALS, it's about 60-30 male to female, here it's more like 80-20. It's predominantly whites. So you can see the breakdown of the race is there. 
Um, like, like typical ALS, it's more limb than bulbar. But again, here with the reversals, we see a shift. So with typically progressive ALS, it's about 60% limb, about 35% bulbar, and about 5% other. And here what you see is it's more like 90% limb, 5% bulbar, and 4% other. Age of onset, pretty similar to typical ALS, early 50s. Um, age of diagnosis, similar. In case you're wondering how long does it take for people to start reversing? So on average, um, from symptom onset to the point where these folks were at their absolute worst was about 32 months. But there's a wide range, you know, going anywhere from a few months to decades. How long did it take them to recover? Well, again, it's about 24 months, but you can see the size of the standard deviation. There's a wide range. So I think about the shortest time that somebody was, you know, clearly noticing that they'd reached their maximum benefit. The fastest recovery was probably around six months. So one of the studies that I've spent the last few years working on with a collaborator, now Dr. Jesse Crail, he was a medical student when he started this, and now he's um, an MD, neurology resident at Washington University, and also with the National ALS Registry, is to try to understand environmental exposures in these patients. And so the idea here is to administer the National ALS Registry 17-part risk factor uh, survey to all the ALS reversals and compare their answers to everyone else who's in the registry with more typically progressive ALS. Now, when we, when we were doing this project, we had a total of 46 ALS reversals. But what you're gonna see here is a theme it's very difficult to get all these people into any one study. So first of all, as I told you earlier, some of the folks are cases from the literature. So in this case, out of 46, 34 were cases that we confirmed, 12 were cases reported in the literature. So when somebody's reported in the literature, there's no way to go back and contact that person to get them to participate in more studies. So of the 34 cases that, that we confirmed, 25, participated in the study. Five said no, three had passed away. One uh, did not speak English well enough to, to complete this uh, national registry's long surveys. And so we were able to get survey data on 25 ALS reversals, and we compared the answers to 6,187 controls, people with more typically progressive ALS in the registry. And so um, there's a lot of surveys where there were no real differences, body mass index, exercise, caffeine intake, smoking, alcohol use, military service, various types of trauma, electric shocks, no differences between reversals and controls. But there were a couple of things that popped out that we thought were interesting. So first using something called the North American Industry Classification System Codes, which is a way of sort of categorizing a whole bunch of diverse jobs, there did seem to be a tendency for jobs that were traditionally associated with higher socioeconomic status to be in the reversals group. So just to give you the data of the reversals, 42% said they held a job as a company executive or owner or professional, such as in healthcare, engineering, or legal sector, compared to only 17% of the controls. We also looked at as many specific jobs as the registry modules had, and we did find a couple of interesting things that stood out. So across all these different jobs that we asked about, reversals were much more likely to have been carpenters, cabinet makers, janitors, maintenance workers, house cleaners, compared to controls. And the odds ratios are pretty huge. They're like more than 10. So you might think, well, maybe with those, with those types of occupations, there would be some specific exposures that you could you know, pick up on. Well, we looked at occupational exposures, so a whole bunch of different kinds of chemicals. We looked at home exposures, again, lots of different chemicals, but also things like pets. Didn't see any differences there. And then we looked at hobby exposures. And we looked at this in two ways, and I think this is really important for what we do next. So the first thing we did is we just, you know, we looked at whether or not people endorsed ever doing that hobby, and we didn't see any difference. But that's probably too simplistic. 
So rather than just whether or not somebody actually did it, we went back and tried to understand how much they did it. Tried to actually see you know, what the dosage of the exposure might be. And there we did see some differences. Reversals had significantly fewer hours of exposure to leather work, painted pictures or furniture, or developed photographs. And reversals also had five times as many hours of woodworking hobby compared to controls. So how do we put this all together? Well, first, the bad news, there's no one single environmental exposure that appears to explain all ALS reversals. That's what we were hoping for, but we didn't find it. But there certainly are some interesting differences in jobs and in hobby exposures. And I would say woodworking really, for me, rises to the top because it shows up in two different ways, both in terms of occupation and in terms of hobby, which are totally separate questions. Now, of course, there's some limitations to this study. We're talking about a very small number of ALS reversals. You know, we're, we're stuck with the questions in the registry. And I mean, they're good questions, but they're by no means perfect. There's a lot of exposures that aren't asked about in the registry. And also uh, very rarely does the registry actually get into like specific dosages and durations and ages at which you might've been exposed. And then finally, whenever you do questionnaires, you know, you've got a recall bias and that might not be the same in the reversals and the controls. So some of the reversals were being asked to remember things that happened 20 years ago, as, as opposed to somebody, you know, that might be a newly diagnosed person with more typically progressive ALS that was trying to remember something that just happened a year ago. So it, it may be that we're comparing apples and oranges there. So we would like to develop a more comprehensive survey which would include more exposures, as well as more, more information about dosages and durations. And you know, this is all um, something that's happening now in epidemiology called the expososome. So it's, it's pretty clear now that epidemiologists are getting away from questionnaires where it's just, did you do this or didn't you do it? It's how much of it did you do, for how long and at what age? And all that information together is believed to be important and how these things influence disease, that's called the expososome. So that's where we're going next. Next project I've spent a lot of time on in the past couple of years, again, with, uh, with Dr. Jesse Crail, but also with Dr. Benatar in the CREATE Consortium and with some really brilliant geneticists and mathematicians at the St. Jude Center for Applied Bioinformatics is looking at the genetics of ALS reversals. And so the idea here is to obtain whole genome sequencing in as many of these patients as we can. And then we're gonna do three things with that information. First, we're gonna to look to see, are there any ALS causing mutations in these ALS reversals? I told you four of them had a family history. So you might expect that some might actually have ALS causing mutations. Second, we wanna look for mutations in these patients that cause other diseases that might mimic ALS. So for example, hereditary spastic paraplegia, because if we found a lot of those, that might suggest that some of these patients are actually mimics that were missed. And then finally, and maybe most interesting of all, we want to look at all the genetic information and the reversals and compare that to people with more typically progressive ALS who are in the CREATE database. Those are the so-called controls. And so how many reversals did we get to participate in this? Well, again, we started out with 46 when this project was, was enrolling. And again, you know, we ran into some trouble. Um, some of these folks were in the literature. Some of them were in other countries and there were rules about, you know, shipping information, genetic information across uh, countries. Some of them had passed away. Three of them declined to participate in the study, but we were able to ultimately um, get samples on 24 ALS reversals. Unfortunately, two of the samples did not result in usable DNA, which does happen in these studies. So we successfully did whole genome sequencing on 22 of the ALS reversals, and we compared them to 527 controls. And so here's the different parts of the study. Part one, we did find one ALS reversal that has a known ALS causing mutation in a gene which is called sequestosome one. And I apologize for any geneticist that might be listening. If I butcher the names of these things, I wish you would give your genes simpler names. Um, that's it, we just, just, just one of the 22. 
But again, I mean, at least for that patient, to me, that's absolute proof that this was not an ALS mimic. I mean, they have an ALS causing gene. They got a disease that looked just like ALS. It's just, it just would be bizarre if that was all coincidental and they actually had something else. Second part was also important. We didn't find any mutations that could cause diseases that might mimic ALS in the ALS reversals. Again, arguing against the possibility that these might be mimics. And then most interesting of all, and, and I think maybe one of the most interesting things that I have found since I started studying ALS reversals, we did find two genes of potential interest, meaning these are significantly more likely to be altered in reversals compared to controls. So the first one is called syntaxin binding protein six, abbreviated STX BP6, also called amycin. Abnormalities in that gene were seen in 27% of the reversals and less than 1% of the controls. The second gene of interest is insulin-like growth factor binding protein seven, which has all those other abbreviations. Abnormalities in this gene were seen in 50% of our reversals and only 6% of our controls. What do we know about these genes? So STXB6, we know a lot about. It appears to code for a protein that is involved in something called snare complex formation. So the snare complex is involved in the trafficking of vesicles in and out of cells, including neurons in the brain. And it's also involved in a pathway which you may have heard of which is called apoptosis, uh, sorry, autophagy. It's called autophagy. And so autophagy is a, is a way for cells to get rid of garbage. It's kind of like a conveyor belt that cells use to get rid of proteins they no longer need, organelles they no longer need. And one of the things that's become very clear in ALS is autophagy is disruptive. It's not happening the way it's supposed to. And that may be why we see so many clumped proteins in the motor neurons of people with ALS. And autophagy is a target actually for ALS clinical trials. Some of you may have heard about trehalose. This is one of the ways that trehalose might work, the drug that's in the Healy platform trial by promoting autophagy. So it's very interesting that so many ALS reversals have abnormalities, unusual abnormalities in this gene. You wonder, could ALS reversals potentially have some sort of naturally more potent autophagy pathway. And there's a way that we're gonna study that, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. So a little less is known about this second gene, but I will say um, what is known suggests that it might be involved in the regulation of insulin-like growth factors. And some of you may know that those are also suspected to be involved in the pathogenesis of ALS. So there's some preclinical data that increasing insulin-like growth factor one in the mutant SOD1 mouse model improves the phenotype in that model. There's some registry data suggesting a, an association between IGF-1 levels and survival. The higher your levels, the better you seem to do when you get ALS. And then there's some, but not all clinical trials that suggested that IGF-1 treatment might help at least some people with ALS. And so again, it leads to a testable hypothesis. Could ALS reversals have a naturally more robust insulin-like growth factor pathway as a result of their genetic abnormalities? And so just to summarize this part, which I think is just fascinating, we now know that at least one of these ALS reversals has a disease-causing genetic mutation. None of them have mutations in, in genes that are expected to cause mimickers, and several of them have abnormalities in one of two specific genes. So far, these appear to be very unusual in patients with more typically progressive ALS, and at least from what we know about these genes, they are plausibly related to ALS pathophysiology. Again, limitations. This is, an, again, a very, very small number of ALS reversals that we, that we were able to get information on. And we've only compared them so far to one single control group, the folks who are in the CREATE database. We would like to look in other control groups like cancer ALS and maybe at some healthy controls as well. So next steps, we're gonna to try to get some more whole genome sequencing on more ALS reversals. There's 
Some of these folks are enrolling in other studies and we may be able to get their genetic information that way. We will compare what we know about the reversals to other control groups, but we will also be carefully examining the phenotype and the cellular function of those ALS reversals who have abnormalities in STXB6 and IGF-BP7 to see, is there something special about their autophagy? Is there something special about their insulin-like growth factor metabolism? There's quite a few other um, STAR projects going on around the world with collaborators. So um, we're looking carefully at the comorbidities and the concomitant treatments, again, with Dr. Crail and the new medical student, Natalie Skidgen. We should have that data to present in early 2023. We're also looking more downstream than the genes. We're looking at the RNA and the proteomics with ALS TVI, and we're inspecting that in early 2023 as well. And then we're looking at the microbiome, the organisms that live in the saliva and the stool of people with ALS reversals compared mm -hmm. to people with more typically progressive ALS. And that data is, is collected and being analyzed as we speak. I hoped I would have it for tonight, but it's not ready. In the future, we hope to look at imaging. We have lots of imaging on these ALS reversals. And we wanna see with, with the radio, neuroradiologists at Duke, is there any clue there? We want to develop the induced pluripotential stem cell lines from these patients. And we've got a group in Australia called Genie US who started that. And then someday if some of these folks die, hopefully not for many years from natural causes, we hope to look carefully at their autopsies and see what's different about the histology of their brain and spinal cord to people who die from more typically progressive ALS. And so one of the things that's really sort of kept me up at night the last couple of years is this, you know, each one of these projects has a rather simple hypothesis. You know, what if it's this one thing or that one thing that explains ALS reversals? And I've just been saying to myself, maybe it's gonna be a lot more complicated. So we know that ALS itself is not caused by one thing. And there's 30 different genes that all together cause only 10% of ALS cases. The other 90%, we don't know what, what's causing them, but it's some people think there's four or five different exposures that, that might explain some of those, and it might be different combinations of exposures. And so if ALS itself is that complicated, it may be that ALS reversals are gonna be complicated too. And maybe they happen because of interactions between endogenous and environmental uh, factors. The good news is that people are now figuring out how to study these types of interactions. And I'm in talks right now with a group that has expertise in something called machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the reason I think that's really cool is I'm gonna have a ton of data. I mean, that just the genetic information alone is, is massive. But imagine when I have, you know, combine that with all the environmental exposure data, combine that with all the RNA and proteomics and microbiome, I will not be able to look at that as a human being and figure out how it fits together but machine learning and artificial intelligence might be able to churn out some patterns that explain ALS reversals. And so hopefully we'll be able to come to an agreement to get that going by the end of next year. Now I told you there was one other program and that is the ROAR program, replication of ALS reversals. And so this, this deals with the idea, could, could it be that these reversals are due to the treatments that these people took? Now I have to say after many years of studying these folks and thinking about this, I personally think this is a real long shot. And the reason is first, there are no two ALS reversals that did exactly the same thing. And second, almost every single thing that ALS reversals have tried, I know of many other patients who have tried and not had ALS reversals. But nonetheless, it's still possible. There are other examples of patients discovering drug effects that researchers had never thought of, Viagra, Nudexta, Researchers had one idea about what those might be good for, and their idea was wrong. And patients actually discovered the things that we use those drugs for now. And so the ROAR program is basically one of small pilot trials of the um, alternative and off-label treatments that are associated with these dramatic ALS reversals. Now, because these products are generally regarded as safe by the FDA, in other words, they're not generally prescription medications or generally vitamins and supplements. And because this program is looking for such a huge signal, not a 20% slowing in progression, but a recovery from ALS, 
the trials that I do in this program look very different from your typical industry-sponsored trials. These trials have very wide inclusion criteria. Almost anyone can participate as long as you can read a consent form and sign it, and as long as you have a computer. Um, these trials do not have placebos. We use historical controls. We don't need in-person visits in these trials. We do all of our visits virtually through the phone or the computer. And the other thing that's different about this program is we're publishing our protocols. Once the FDA and our IRB approves the protocol, we're publishing on our website, www.alsreversals.org. And the reason for that is that we know there are people all around the world who want to self-experiment with things and they may not be getting great guidance. And so maybe they can find one of these protocols, bring it to their doctor and they could try something that at least at one time we thought might be reasonable with specific information about dosages and durations and outcome measures and things like that. So as many of you know, I told you about this last time, a few years back, I did my first ROAR trial. I picked a supplement called Lunacin. It was a peptide that comes from soybeans. It was supposed to be a histone deacetylase inhibitor. Interestingly, that's exactly the way sodium phenylbutyrate is supposed to work, one of the two ingredients in uh, Relivrio. Um, this was supposed to be very safe, and it was associated with a really dramatic reversal of Bulbar ALS that was validated by an entire ALS team in Providence, Rhode Island. And so I did this trial, and, and unfortunately, there was some bad news. There was also some good news. The bad news, the product didn't work. Nobody's ALS. I enrolled 50 people. I studied them on this product for an entire year. Nobody's ALS seemed to slow down, much less stop or reverse. I couldn't find any evidence in these patients that this supplement did what the manufacturer said it was going to do, which was alter histone acetylation patterns. And it wasn't even as safe as I was led to believe. Most people had side effects on this. Some people had GI side effects so severe we had to hospitalize them. But the good news is this unusual design worked very well. This was the fastest enrolling trial in the history of ALS. Most ALS trials enrolled about two patients per site per month. This enrolled nine. The people who enrolled in this study were much more representative of a clinic population. They were much more diverse. That's one of the things we worry about with our clinical trials. If we're only taking the best of the best into our clinical trials and we find something that works like Relivrio, how do we know it works for the other 95% of the people in our clinics who couldn't have qualified for the trial? We don't. Um, so at least if we get something that might work in one of these Roar trials, I personally would have more confidence because we would have seen it work in a more typical population. In spite of people who were more advanced, some having ALS for more than 10 years, people stuck with the trial just as well as they do with traditional trials. And they easily learn to measure things and they would measure them when they were supposed to and record them exactly like we did on a website. And we learned that we empowered hundreds of people around the world with the protocol to self-experiment with their own doctors with something that at one time we thought was reasonable. So the last time I talked to you, I had just started a second ROAR trial and that was of a product called Theracurmin. This is a, a water soluble form of curcumin a molecule that is found in spices like turmeric and curry powder, a molecule that has a lot of mechanisms for potentially treating ALS. Uh, curcumin products are associated with more ALS reversals than any other supplement or medication category. Nine ALS reversals are associated with curcumin products. So that's why I brought this one up second. Again, we had some good news and bad news. Bad news, this product didn't seem to work either didn't seem to slow, stop, or reverse any of the 50 people's ALS that we studied on this product for six months. But again, from a design standpoint, I was pleased to see that even though we were doing this in the middle of a global pandemic, we still enrolled faster than most ALS trials, and we still retained our patients fairly well. We still enrolled a very diverse population with some people with very advanced ALS, and we still were able to empower people around the world with a protocol. So where are we going next with this ROAR program? Well, there's a lot of other things I could study. I know there's a lot of other products associated with some reversals, but let's get back to that question that I asked before, the one that keeps me up at night. What if I'm being too simple with my thoughts about this? As I already said, 
just about every product that I know of that's associated with the reversal has already been tried by multiple people in my clinic and they did not get better on it. So it's clear that there's not a single product or combination of products that's gonna reverse everyone's ALS. What if some products only work for some people? If the biology of ALS is different in different individuals, maybe there's not one single treatment that's gonna reverse ALS in everyone. And maybe reversals just happened upon the exact right treatment or treatments for their biology. So I bring you the latest wrinkle in the ROAR program. I have found a group of brilliant scientists in Australia called Genie US, and they have developed something called Deep Integrated Genomics Analysis Platforms. They abbreviate it as DIGAP. You can read more about it at that link right there, but it's pretty fascinating. So they're looking at whole genome sequencing and they're not just looking at ALS causing mutations. They're looking at all the variations in each person's whole genome sequencing. And they believe that by looking at all that information together, they can stratify people with ALS into one of four categories based on the biology that is most likely driving their ALS progression. Category one, neuroinflammation. Category two, oxidative stress. Category three, disrupted intracellular transport and autophagy. Category four, mitochondrial dysfunction. So the ROAR Genius trial is going to look just like the Thera Kerman trial, widely inclusive, virtual, historically not placebo controlled, except we're going to try to personalize the treatments in this one. And so patients will enroll. We will draw their blood after they consent, send it to these Australian um, folks. And uh, in a couple of months, they'll get back to me and tell me what category that person belongs in. And what we're going to do here then is give them one of four treatments. Each of these treatments will be uh, previously shown by a biomarker to affect that pathway in humans at a dose that is safe and tolerable. And each of the four products will have been associated with at least one ALS reversal. Now, exactly what are the four products going to be? Can't tell you yet. We're narrowing it down, but that's still being discussed. But I'm pretty excited about this. I think it's really interesting. So before I give you my conclusion slide, I want to leave you with a word of caution. I see more and more individuals and groups out there that are telling patients they know how to reverse their ALS. I'm sad to tell you, they do not. No one knows how to reverse ALS yet. Please read the ALS Untangled review entitled 10 Red Flags. And anytime you're considering going to a place that says they're going to reverse your ALS, look at this list. The more of these red flags you see associated with the place, the faster you should run away with it, run away from it. So first, large out-of-pocket costs. When people are doing research, they shouldn't be charging you tons of cash. It's unethical. We don't charge people to participate in the studies I told you about. Nobody should be advertising their clinic or their treatment for dozens of the world's worst conditions that don't have anything in common. Every research study should have appropriate oversight. In the United States, that means FDA and IRB oversight to protect your safety in the study. There should be a very detailed informed consent that you have a chance to take home and ask questions about before you get treated. There should be a clear mechanism, a biological mechanism that's plausible by which this thing should help. There should be things measured, validated outcome measures like the ALS FRSR. You know, those things should be presented at scientific meetings, not on Twitter or Facebook. Science is, is done at meetings where there's peer review, where we can talk about it as a scientific community and provide feedback. It's really important for how things advance. If the only evidence for a treatment is somebody online who supposedly recovered from their ALS as a result, that's really not very solid evidence. As I've already told you, this kind of stuff can happen. Watch out for people who are giving you medical advice without any qualifications to do so. And especially watch out for people who are portraying themselves as victims 
and advising you to divorce yourself from mainstream doctors. You know, unfortunately, we haven't figured out how to reverse ALS yet, but in the meantime, we have discovered a lot of things that can make a person's life better and longer. And when folks divorce themselves from mainstream medicine, they lose out on all those things that we've learned about that we know help. So just to conclude, we've got these ALS reversals. We keep finding more. We're up to 58 now. I'm not the first one to discover these, these folks, but I am the first one to put them all together and to try to collaborate with people around the world to study them. I believe they might provide clues to endogenous mechanisms that fight the disease. And maybe someday we could use those clues to develop better treatments. And so we've got an operational definition, testable hypotheses, lots of really smart folks all over the world involved. But in the meantime, I know it's hard, but you gotta be patient. No one knows why these 58 people got better. Associations are not the same as causality. Just because someone took something and then recovered does not mean that thing was the reason for their recovery. So to follow um, along and, and get more updated information, I try to keep these two websites up to date about ALS reversals. And then I'll just end uh, with, with a few thanks. First, I know there's a lot of people living with ALS that are watching this. And I just wanna thank you for inspiring me every day to get up and to fight. I mean, I couldn't do it without you. You're, you're just terrific partners. I wanna thank all the, uh, the families and the patient advocacy groups, especially Larry Vance Hughes, ALS Foundation, Team Drea, Racing for ALS, Martha Olson, Fernandez Foundation, Augie's Quest, ALS TDI, all the other families and groups that donate to this work. Thank all my collaborators, the students at Duke, uh, Dan Harris and Jesse Crail, Natalie Skidgen, the National ALS Registry, CREATE, St. Jude, Duke Microbiome Center, ALS TDI, patients like me. I need all these brains to help me figure this out. And then last but not least, got to thank my Duke ALS care team for helping me build a foundation of great patient care upon which all my research is built. So thank you for listening and I will stop sharing and I will take your questions now. Wow, talk about an informative would be an understatement presentation. I Seriously, thank you for that, it's incredible. We have a lot of questions, so I will not delay. I will be asking them with some student ambassadors as well. Uh, to kick off the first question, which you touched upon at the very end of your presentation, do you believe that there needs to be an either or approach to treatment for ALS in terms of allopathic versus integrative? And have you found some aspects of the integrative approach to be more helpful for patients who are clin in clinical trials or using medications that have been found to somewhat be useful for slowing down disease progression? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't really uh, draw a firm line, you know, between traditional um, and non-traditional or integrative or allopathic. I just feel like um, we need to be scientific about it. So for example, when I first heard about acupuncture being used for ALS, when I first heard about the possibility of fecal transplants for ALS, I scratched my head. I said, I'm not really sure. I understand how there could be a plausible mechanism. And then I started doing some reading and it turns out there are mechanisms by which those things could help. And in fact, there's even some real early data um, and trials underway. And so I have no problem. Many of my patients are, are also under the care of, of non-traditional um, therapists or healers. As long as we're doing things scientifically and we're all in agreement, what, what I really hate to see is what I mentioned before is when someone goes to um, a non-traditional clinic and they're told, you know, you gotta, get out of, you gotta get out of those mainstream clinics. They're not helping you. They're, they're probably harming you. You can't take things like Riliazol, Radicava, Relivrio. That's going to poison you. It's going to keep you from getting an ALS reversal. It's, 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 no, it's crazy. Um, we have discovered some things that help. It can be a foundation upon which experimentation in a reasonable, logical way, the ways that I've outlined can take place. And that doesn't have to just be in mainstream medicine. It can be anywhere, but, but you know, it's got to follow scientific principles. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that response. Um, before I ask the next question, I just want to give a brief introduction. Um, my name is Declan. I'm a senior in high school and I live in Manhattan. I've been with Everything ALS um, since this past summer, and I, and I was first drawn to it due to my uncle's diagnosis of ALS a few years ago. Uh, once again, I just want to thank uh, thank you, Dr. Bedlack, for making the time to speak with us. It's been amazing to learn from you. 
And then, yeah, without further ado, I guess here's the next question. Um, can the Mac F1 defect cause a slow progression in form of ALS? Is this defect found more in familial patients um, compared to sporadic ones? Well, you know what, Declan, you're going to have to email that one to me because I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to have to do a little reading about that. I don't, I don't entirely uh, know that much about what you just asked. The, you said Mac F1. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you shoot me an email after, and I'll, I'll see what I can find out, and I'll be happy to answer your question after I've done some reading about it. But that's not one that I know very much about, unfortunately. Okay, cool. No problem. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, there's always something new to learn and, and research. Uh, our next question is going to be for our new student ambassador, and I believe also our youngest, show that we are even getting the youth involved in trying to figure out the uh, causality and hopefully the cure for ALS. I'm going to turn it over to Miranda. Hi, I'm Miranda. I'm a junior in high school. It's really cool to be here and just have this opportunity. Um, to start with the question, do you have any suggestions for promoting the critically important science of reversal to ALS organization researchers and their facilities? and their facilitators um, who may challenge it. So yeah, question about, you know, getting this research to be more, more widely accepted amongst different groups. And the good news is, I appreciate you asking that because <laughs> for, for, for a few years, uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of acceptance of this concept. And I think more and more now there's acceptance. I think as people see that a lot of these cases, it's not just me finding these cases, a lot of these cases were found by other neurologists. And you know, we're starting to see now even some people who were initially skeptical who are finding ALS reversals in their studies. So, I mean, um, uh, one of my colleagues was doing a clinical trial of a uh, injectable stem cell preparation and found an ALS reversal. And I think that's the first one that he saw. Another one of my colleagues is involved in CREATE and, and found an ALS reversal there. Um, ALS TDI had an ALS reversal that occurred you know, well, the person was participating in their precision medicine program. So as, as more of these things pop up, oh, there was one in the AMX0035 trial as well. As more of these things pop up and more people see them with their own eyes, there's been more belief. But I am thrilled at the, at the number of really brilliant scientists all over the world who've agreed to collaborate, even though I don't have a lot of funding to share with them. Um, it's a lot of work. I mean, I, I tried to summarize it um, in a short talk. It was longer than I wanted it to be, but it, believe me, I mean, some of those slides that I put up there were like over a year's worth of work to, to get the results from just one slide. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it is starting to happen. I was very encouraged at the NIH a hearing that we had a, a couple of weeks ago where they kind of laid out their game plan for how they're gonna use some of the money from Act for ALS. And one of the things that I loved was they're planning to do a big natural history study. And I, I really think that's so important because that, that's going to show some of the things that I told you about, but in much larger numbers, it's gonna show plateaus. It's gonna show small reversals. Inevitably, there will be a few large reversals that occur during that study. And this is all going to be under the microscope of the world's most brilliant researchers and these people in this natural history study, it's not just going to be clinical outcomes. They'll probably be genetics and biomarkers and, and all kinds of things that I haven't even thought of to do that they'll think of to do. And so, uh, you know, I, I was really happy to hear that because I think they will be involved once they start seeing what I'm seeing. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, you just kind of touched upon this. This flows in perfectly. Have you seen any ALS reversals as a result of mesenchymal stem cell transplants? And if so, do you think it's a form of treatment that you could recommend for your patients? Yeah, so I, I, I only know of one ALS reversal that occurred with a mesenchymal uh, stem cell transplant. It's a complicated case because there were a lot of things going on. And unfortunately that is true with some of these patients. They didn't just have ALS, they had other things. This particular patient actually also had myasthenia gravis, a disease which, which can mimic some of the symptoms and signs of ALS. And they were on immunosuppressive therapy. So you know, as to why that person got better, well, it, it appeared to me from reading the outcome measures that it was much more likely to be improvements in the ALS than the myasthenia. Um, but as to which one of the things might've played a role, very, very difficult to tell. 
And, you know, as far as, you know, can I recommend mesenchymal stem cells? No, I don't think I can right now. Um, I think there's, there's some people out there that have particular mesenchymal stem cell protocols that look interesting, but I really believe that we need more research to understand exactly, you know, how many cells, where the cells should be put, how often, with what, and even then, I think these may only help a subset of patients, which would be defined by a combination maybe of genetics and biomarkers and you know scores on the clinical measures. I just feel like there's a lot more that we need to learn before we can endorse this as a widespread treatment for ALS. That's my opinion. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, to continue this discussion about ALS reversals, how or like what do you think about the ALS reversals presented by healingals.org? Yeah, so um, healing ALS actually was very helpful to me getting um, some of these some of these ALS reversals. And I think, you know, I love that part of what they do, highlighting the stories. I will say um, we don't define ALS reversals the same way. And so you may find out that they have a larger number than I do. As I told you, I'm setting a very high bar. I'm, I'm being, you know, very strict about how I define ALS reversals. And there, there may be some that they, that they call ALS reversals that I cannot include in my program because they don't might meet my rigid criteria. And you know, the other difference is that my program is not prescriptive. I'm not, I'm not endorsing any particular therapy you know, to cause an ALS reversal. As I said in my last slide, I, I feel like that's premature. I don't think anyone knows how to reverse ALS and we shouldn't be telling people that we do. I will agree, though. I, I love hearing that we all work together, and it's nice to see there's some overlap in the uh, communication and the research. Um, you also mentioned in, in your presentation about uh, Amalex uh, 0035. Um, in your opinion overall, how much has the medicine in general for ALS advanced in the past five years? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's advanced a lot. I mean, in the last five years, I mean, we've had Radicava, which I think may help some people. I don't think it helps everyone, but we also now have an oral form, which, which makes it a lot easier for people to take. So it's, it's being used by a much larger percentage of people. Um, we have learned that new Dexta, which we used to think was only good for pseudobulbar affect. Now we've got two studies suggesting that it actually can improve bulbar function. It can improve the clarity of speech, a person's ability to handle secretions, a person's swallowing ability can all improve on that medicine. And that's a relatively new discovery. And then, you know, we've got what we now call Relivrio in Canada, Albrioza, uh, previously known as AMX0035. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good option for people as well. You know, you may, people may have heard me testify um, to the FDA. I mean, I'm only going to testify if I really am excited about something. And I was very excited about what I saw in that trial. It is only one trial, it's not a huge trial, it's not a super long trial, but nonetheless, you know, with the tools that we have, that's about as good a result as I've ever seen in the history of ALS, what we got with that medicine. And so that's why twice, you know, I took the time to, to testify and explain why I thought that should be approved. Um, and, you know, we may find out in three years when the larger, longer study is, is completed, maybe, maybe we find out it doesn't work, but to me, I mean, Drug approvals is never going to be a perfect science. There's always going to be some mistakes. Which mistake would you rather make? Would you rather make a mistake of approving something today that we think might work um, and then finding out in two years, well, guess what? It doesn't, but at least people got to try something that we thought was safe and it was pretty easy to take. Um, I don't think anyone's going to be too upset about that. Or would you rather make the mistake that, you know, in two years, we, we decide not to approve it today. And in two years, we find out, wow. It worked really well. Now, how do you go back to all those patients and families and explain, you know, why they lost their loved ones and why they're much more disabled than they needed to be? Because we wouldn't, you know, take a chance. I just, I just feel like, you know, with that particular trial, the results were so good that even with one small trial, it warranted an approval. So, yeah, um, definitely. Um, all right. Next question is, um, have you seen a reversal in a C9 ORF72 or SOD1 case? So the answer is not that I know of. So remember, um, we only got genetic information 
on 22 of the 58 ALS reversals. Again, some of them, you know, they're published in, in, in papers that are 50 years old. So there was no way to go back and find those people and get them genotyped. So we're gonna keep looking. It won't surprise me if we do find somebody with one of those ALS causing mutations. But as of today, we do have one person, one of the 22 that we genotyped that had an ALS causing mutation. It wasn't in one of those genes. It was in sequestas sequestasome one, I believe was, was what I had written down. Um, and we do know of, of four ALS reversals who have a positive family history. Now we haven't genotyped all those patients. One person actually has two first degree relatives with ALS. You would think that person has an ALS causing gene, but we don't have that information yet. So I think, you know, we're off to a good start, but we got to, we got to keep pushing to get more of these people genotyped and to find more of them too. Wow. Well, and the research has to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to be uh, respectful of your time. So if you have a heart out, please let us know. <laughs> um, but uh, with that being said, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, in terms of oxygen therapy for cells, what are your opinions on it for treatment? Do you think it could help to combat ALS? Yeah, so oxygen therapy is, is it's, it's not one thing, right? So there's different ways to deliver oxygen. You know, for example, there's hyperbaric chambers, there's ozone therapy, which is a, which is a you know, form of oxygen. And then, you know, there may even be some people who are actually getting oxygen, you know, inhaling oxygen. What I can say for all those things is that I've not seen convincing evidence that they help. There actually was a clinical trial of hyperbaric oxygen therapy for people with ALS and it didn't seem to produce any benefit. Um, there are theoretical reasons why each one of those things could potentially be harmful to people with ALS. And you know, when it comes to just inhaling oxygen, I definitely don't think that's a good idea for most people with ALS. So you know, it's a, it's a long conversation, but the short answer is um, a person with ALS probably should only be inhaling oxygen if their oxygen saturations are below 90%. That would suggest that something else may be going on that's impairing their ability to oxygenate, like a pneumonia, COPD, a blood clot in the lungs. For most people with ALS, when they get short of breath, oxygen is not what they need. What they need is pressure. So they need what's called non-invasive ventilation pressure down the nose and mouth to help them take deeper breaths and get rid of carbon dioxide because oxygenation is easy. Getting rid of carbon dioxide is not. And it's getting rid of carbon dioxide that's actually the thing that kills people with ALS. They can't get rid of it. And as a result, it builds up so high that they just drift off into a deep sleep and they just don't wake up. That's typically how it ends. Uh, yeah. And the next question is, um, what are the steps being taken to build up a database with all ALS patients to evaluate the vital signals and or body conditions at the onset of ALS and also um, after possible healing from ALS? Yeah, so uh, I would say that right now there isn't one central database where all that information is, is being collected, but of course people share. You know, once, once we've finalized all of our analyses, on the genetics of, of the ALS reversals that we were able to get, I do plan to put that out there and make it you know, widely shareable so anybody who wants it can, can have it and try to analyze it themselves. Um, but there isn't one place where all that stuff is. However, there are people sharing. Now, I do think that's it's possible that may change with what I told you earlier about the natural history study that the NIH is planning. It would be really nice if there was a massive database that you know most people, with ALS that come to clinics could be entered into. It's a pretty big endeavor to think about how that would work, but it would be helpful in so many ways. Yeah, I know you have seen ALS uh, progress in probably every way, shape, and form. So with your expertise, if an individual living with ALS is in the very advanced stage, um, have you seen any reversals go to that extent? I know McFinn uh, would, would be a testament to that. But with that being said, do you believe there's any drug or supplement currently available worth doing for those more advanced patients? Yeah, so there's really two questions here. The first question is, is there ever a point at which someone's progressed so far that they couldn't recover? And my answer is no. I think that people can recover at any stage of the disease. The second question, the answer is, I don't know, and no one knows. So if I knew of exactly 
what treatment, reverse ALS, this talk would have been two minutes long in one slide. I would have just said, everybody who's listening needs to take this right away. And we would be um, out of business right now. <laughs> which would be good. I would be happy to. Absolutely. I have, I have designs on uh, becoming a fashion designer. So I, first I need to cure ALS before I can start that career. But no, I mean, there are a, a number of supplements out there that we have written ALS Untangled about that I think have plausible mechanisms, positive preclinical data. They're associated with at least one ALS reversal. They're reasonably safe. They're reasonably inexpensive. You know, if I had advanced ALS, I would get together with somebody who knows about those things and, you know, could talk to me about those. And I would try one and I would have that person monitor me. And I would probably say, let's, let's decide how long we're going to try it, what we're going to measure and when we're gonna decide that the measurements are not going in the right direction. And in that case, we'll switch over to something else. But this is what I do with my own patients is, you know, we try first to find trials for them. When they can't find trials, we try to find expanded access programs. When we can't find those, we self-experiment. And, you know, again, I try to always with my ALS Untangle reviews, have a list of things that I can talk to each one of my patients about, but we do it in a very scientific way. It's not just, you know, throw a whole bunch of bottles at someone and send them loose. I mean, we want to actually do this in a scientific way. Yeah, thanks for that. Oh, informative uh, response. Um, what are your thoughts on juvenile ALS? Yeah, so juvenile ALS is, is so interesting. And a lot of it is caused by the same genetic mutation, which is called FUS. And what's really cool is that we have some theories about exactly how FUS might cause disease. And in fact, at Columbia, they actually have a clinical trial. And I also believe an expanded access program for people that don't qualify for the trial for an antisense oligonucleotide infusion against FUS. So again, I, if I had a patient with FUS, the first thing I would do is see if I could connect them with the folks at Columbia and see if they could get into either the trial or the expanded access program there. Yeah, I, I know I read the article that I think the uh, youngest person now officially diagnosed with ALS, I believe at the time was seven. So who knows what research that can lead to in the future for the overall disease. And I do want to be respectful of your time. So I may make this the last question. I think it's our biggest takeaway question. Uh, in your opinion, is there any common thing or things you have discovered in all of the ALS reversals that you have studied? So James, the, the one thing that I'm sure about that they all have in common is embraced by McFinn. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you all think of McFinn, what's the first word that comes to mind? Positive. Positive. <laughs> He's the yeah. most positive person. So here's the trick. I don't know if all these people were super positive before they started to recover from ALS, or if they're super positive because they recovered from ALS. Mm -hmm. But I, I do believe that positivity matters in how people do with the disease. Now, I've been an ALS doctor at Duke for 22 years. I've seen 4,000 unique people with the disease. And I, as I said, they, they all do very differently from each other. But you know, some of, one of probably the most important things in how someone does, in my opinion, is their attitude. And, and there actually are some studies in other diseases that say the same thing, that people who are super positive, hopeful, proactive, they seem to do better medically than people who are the opposite. Um, and, and I don't know why that is. I mean, there's lots of things you can think of as theories, but, but for right now, I mean, that's the one thing that I think they all have in common, at least the ones I've you know, talked to and interviewed um, but I hope to find a, a bigger biological clue that I can manipulate um, in the future soon. Well, if you ever need more positive people, I know we have got a giant cohort here and no shortage of that. I want to thank you. It is always an amazing pleasure and honor to have you here. We always leave so much more informed when you visit us. We're going to enter our open forum part of, of our talk yeah. series. You're more than welcome to, to join and stay, but if you can't, we understand. Um, and I just want to thank you again for joining us tonight. And, and talk about positive. I just wanted to mention, thank you so much, Dr. Bedlock. And you know, your fashion just brings joy. So thank you for that. And what you embrace to uh, get joy for ALS patients in your own way, it, it just shows through. 
So everything you do is so special. So well, thank you, Indy. That mean that means a lot coming from you. I have the greatest respect for you and for your organization. I think this is such an awesome way to do research, this sort of crowdsourcing that you're doing. I love, I love, you know, the fact that there's no barriers to people participating. And I love the, you know, just the the apolitical dissemination of information. I mean, whoever wants to come and listen and talk about this, I love this. So I'm I'm always happy to come on and talk. And hopefully next year I can come back and I'll have a big breakthrough to talk about. That's yes. That's my dream. And thank you. And uh, you know, you're working with us. We have got about 182,000 unique visitors from 44 countries on our YouTube channel right now. So um, Amazing. Uh, we've watched over 40,000 hours of our 65 hours of uh, content. So um, this is reaching wide and globally. So thank you. Keep up the good work and happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah.